Hello. Uh, thank you uh, for coming to the public lecture series of the Architectural Association. Uh, today we have the, the pleasure to, to have uh, Marta Schwartz lecturing, I believe, for the first time at, at the Architectural Association, which is, uh, which is good. So uh, she's going to introduce uh, just shortly uh, who is she and what it, does she do. Uh, Marta Schwartz is professor in practice of landscape architecture. Her practice, Marta Schwartz Partners, is a leading international practice whose work focuses on activating and regenerating urban sites and city centers. Situated at the intersection of landscape, art, and urbanism, Marta Schwartz Partners has 20 years of experience designing and implementing installation, gardens, civic plazas, parks, institutional landscape, corporate herbosler, master plans, urban and urban regenerator projects. Marta Schwartz Partners is also working with cities at a strategic level as they take a view to sustainability at a city or regional scale. The office work demonstrate a deep commitment to the urban landscape and public realm as the platform for sustainability cities that are healthy across all aspects, sectors and domains of urban life. Marta Schwartz is also a founder of the Working Group of Sustainable Cities at Harvard University and is a spoken person for the role of the urban landscape in sustainability. Her recent projects include the Abu Dhabi Financial Center, the Banke, Center, the Banke Headquarters in Shenzhen, China, the Nine Elves Developments in London, and a permanent art installation for the Xi'an International Horticultural Exposition 2011. Her newest book, Recycling Spaces, edited by Emily Both, uses the work of the practice to illustrate the multivalent role urban landscape play in the, in the creation of he healthy cities. So um, I believe also that she's going to work and she's going to show, sorry, all these te projects to in today's presentation. So please join me to welcome Marta Schroeder. Okay, um, thank you all for coming to uh, this lecture. I am very, very pleased to, to be here and honored to speak here at the AA. Um, we uh, have a number, we've had a number of uh, people from the AA working in our office, so we're very uh, fond of the students that you actually produce. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just say, uh, first of all, that uh, uh, we are based here in London. Our office is in Shoreditch. We've been here for a while. Uh, we, our work is global. Um, and uh, we really, I, I just wanted to say that we have had so many really talented people in our office and that the work that I'm going to show you is not the work of mine, it's the work of our group, and um, we're really, uh, I think we have really benefited by having just excellent designers and kind of aggressive thinkers and people who like to share uh, visual ideas in our office. So I just wanted to thank and give thanks to the people who've worked in our office over time. Um, as Alfred was saying is that uh, uh, this is our book that we've just recently put out, and the book really talks about how the landscape uh, functions in cities because, uh, and I will talk a little bit more about this. Um, as I explained, this is going to be a highly theoretical um, uh, lecture. I hope everybody brought their pens and pencils and um, because you'll want to take lots of copious notes. but. Um, the urban landscape actually is a highly technological um, kind of platform upon which we live our lives. So uh, most people think of the landscape as the environment, but actually the urban landscape uh, is more rooted in social, cultural, and economic issues because hopefully the big scale uh, landscape strategies have been worked out at a planning level. That's not to say that our ethics isn't to try to make every site work environmentally. But um, we haven't really recently ever hit real dirt in the places we work for a very long time. So the question is, is what do you do when you are working inside the city? Um, the, the topic I was going to talk about is context tonight, but um, 
Uh, I thought instead I would complain and whinge. Uh, I happen to think whinge is one of the best English English words ever invented. And I thought I would just do that. And I probably will talk about context while I'm whinging ab about just stuff in general, but I thought I would um, just take this opportunity to talk a little bit about um, why we do what we do, because I really basically feel terribly misunderstood and uh, probably like uh, any designer just really wants to be loved. But um, uh, there are all these myths that I imagine surround our, our practice. So whether it's true or not is probably irrelevant because I live inside my own head. Okay, we are starting off with context. One of the issues is that we're a practice that doesn't take context seriously. I, I'm, I'm perplexed about this because uh, a lot of the contexts we work in are so terribly trashed and degraded. I'm not sure what that means, but anyway, so we're non-contextual. Um, evidently, uh, I personally hate trees. I, I hate trees. Um, in fact, that extends to nature. I hate nature. I'm a nature hater because if I like nature, we would put more green into our projects, which we do when we can, um, but if not, we'll paint it. Um, we do pop. Um, we're pop landscape architects, evidently. Um, okay. Um, we are too designy. Uh, our stuff is too designed because, well, landscapes aren't supposed to be too designed. They're, I mean, they should be natural, but I'll get into that more. But that's one problem with our office. Maybe it is too designy, actually. That, that's, that's, that's actually probably a correct whinge. Uh, another problem is that, yeah, we can't be found. Um, I evidently am so gone to wherever that nobody can find where our practice is. So I just want to say we actually are here in London. So put that down in your notes. We're here in London. Um, what we do isn't really landscape. That's probably true if you, you know, depending on how you define the landscape. So we don't do landscape. We don't really do art either. So what the hell do we do? This is a problem. Like, n nobody quite knows what we do. Um, I'm a bitch, and <laughs> it's probably, because uh, you know, I have a design ego, right, which automatically means that I've got to be a bitch. Because, well, women are enablers. It's really bad manners to be a, a woman and design things, actually. <laughs> that, that's. And being old is terrible on top of it. But yeah, so I'm a bitch. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, maybe that's true. I, I don't know. It's hard for me to. I don't think I am, but I, I could be. All right. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I'll, I'll know. You know. I, we could. I could argue that. But. All right. So the point is, is that kind of why do people have these ideas? And you know, people don't, haven't even met me think I'm a bitch. So it's like, well, I'm not sure about that. Or why are we too designy? And what does that mean in terms of, well, why is that when other designers who design shoes and cars and buildings and hairdos and everything else, but the landscape is really, that's a bad place to be a designer because it turns out that most everyone has very, very strong feelings about what landscape should be. And uh, this is interesting. I'm running a studio at Harvard right now, and it's kind of based on um, kind of scientific um, uh, responses to our perceptions. And one student actually found research that, in fact, the landscape that you grow up in kind of imprints on you, like you know, a mother duck to a duckling. And so you carry around this kind of normative view of what a landscape is, or culturally, what a landscape should be, and um, it you know it's it's really most people. This is what we think about landscape. When I say landscape, you know it is green, it's beautiful, it's idyllic, and even though we all live in these places, when we say landscape, kind of that's what pops up into our head. Now, I mean, everybody has a slightly different idea of what their landscape kind of dream is but we still carry it around it. So if you say, well, actually, um, 
our landscape isn't like that, at least not where I live or where you know, a lot of people in the world live. It, it's a different thing entirely. But man, when you say, well, you know, maybe uh, we should be thinking about it differently, they go, oh no, you're, you're really, really, you're a bad person or too designy. So what the result of this is that the landscape actually falls from grace. Um, our views of landscape, it, it's either, it's like a Victorian view of women. You're either an angel or you're a whore. So, you know, either you are a beautiful green idyllic landscape or you're trash, you know. And so this is the kind of landscapes we, we, we make for ourselves in the city. I mean, yes, it's nice The you know, the people in this uh, housing development, they have a landscape around them, but because nobody advocates for it or designs it or cares it, about it or figures out how it's used, it turns into a place for parking, garbage cans, um, walking your dog, you know, there's dog shit all over it. Um, I mean, they're very under-tended and they tend to be the most toxic places in the city are these landscapes which are actually conceived to be healthy because that's what landscapes should do is that the green creates health and so you surround your buildings with green tutus. So, I mean, it ends up being very flabby space. I call it a flabby space. So, Okay, so, I mean, here we have, you know, modernism, the you know, 20th century, the invention of architecture and, and technology, and the idea that architecture can be an art form, a sculpture that can be enjoyed from three dimensions, can go up tall, beautiful. It's a great idea, and the idea that somehow we can lift ourselves off the landscape and preserve it so that we have this utopian landscape underneath it, Great concept. Of course, what happens when you lift the building up off the landscape, again, this is kind of what happens to it. It gets used for pretty indiscriminate uses. It's not nature. So, I mean, this is a typical typology where we, we lift our buildings up, but uh, the problem is, is that the actual landscape uh, gets um, kind of eaten up. And um, the I mean, my, my point of view about this is between the, our ideas about what landscape should be, which is it's about nature, it's natural, you know, it functions environmentally. I mean, there are all sorts of things that it should be doing. And between our ideas about how the buildings sit in nature has really diminished the role of uh, what the landscape can, uh, how it actually plays out in creating cities. So we have a lot of very unhappy cities, especially uh, in, you know, in cities that were either constructed or reconstructed in the uh, 60s. Um, this has been a particularly toxic period for city buildings, and, and, uh, or building cities, let me put it that way, and um, it, the role of the landscape um, in terms of kind of collectivizing and having meaningful spaces has been greatly diminished. Um, so. The other thing is that um, the, the, we, we, we carry around a lot of moralism when it, really, when it comes to the topic of landscapes, and much more so than buildings, because the landscape be, is a platform for the environment, for green, for you know, a passive interaction with, the, with buildings, and it really should not carry content. It should not be a cultural art form. It shouldn't, sh it shouldn't have design content. A lot of people have a hard time with that. Most people do. Actually, probably most of you guys do, to tell you the truth. So it's okay for architecture to do that. Everybody's used to the idea that we have to build architecture. We need shelter. And because we build it, we can give form and meaning to it. But the landscape doesn't come with that predisposed idea or the morality of that. So, I mean, okay, um, uh, this is very typical. There are, you know, as I was saying, there are right and wrong landscapes. You know, the one to your left um, is, that's correct, that is a landscape, but the one to the right is not a landscape. But what is it? It, it is a landscape. We're looking at a landscape. That, that's, a la those are, you know, that's a landscape that we build when we're not thinking about designing or building landscapes. That's the kind of landscapes we build. But, you know, even within the profession of landscape architecture, you know, there are big fights. And uh, uh, have you guys seen um, uh, 
Uh, Blazing Saddles. This is from Blazing Saddles. I'm a big Mel Brooks fan. This is where the Cowboys burst into the studio when a group of kind of um, top hatted um, dancers are doing a Busby Berkeley kind of dance step and they get into this great big brawl. So my interpretation is that the gardeners are these kind of elegant kind of top hatted you know beautiful gentlemen are basically getting beaten up by these rowdy unruly nasty cowboys who are the landscape architects and the, you know we don't even agree within that whole topic what our roles are but I mean that's really the fun part of the profession okay so question is, is what do you think the landscape is or what do you th you know my guess is that you think that the landscape is green it's natural that its main function is environmental stewardship that we need to take care of it um, that it should function on an environmental level but certainly not on an intellectual basis so I mean I agree our job is is environmental stewardship absolutely it is especially given kind of the way that you know climate change and how it's going to impact us um, is now being understood but I think almost everybody agrees with this diagram this is how the landscape functions basically as a setting um, in terms of a uh, background it really is the passive setting you know the, the incohate feminine horizontal that gives is the yin to the you know the masculine constructed kind of culturally determined designed building like isn't this what it's supposed to be uh, most people think that's true the, the other thing is that the landscape is beautiful and that's its job that's its primary job and I mean I agree with that because I think that's all of our jobs here is to create beauty and meaning and uh, connection to other human beings otherwise we really are a waste of space the, the problem with the landscape is that um, we kind of are seen as fluffers you know we kind of fluff up the, the bottom of buildings and that's our job but in fact and if you guys are in landscape urbanism you fully understand that we have come to under, understand and appreciate the fact that the landscape has to be thought of as a strategically designed multi-layered platform uh, where your environment is taken into account you know how people live how people make money um, how people enjoy one another and how they connect where you put your subways you know how you get around in bicycles you know how you have lots of different choices for urban spaces on and on and on so we need to be thinking about that now that we are urbanized and these spaces are precious but um, and they should be beautiful they sh if we don't make them and who knows what beauty means but if we don't make them meaningful where people connect then we will fail it won't matter that it's done with sustainable technology it means that people won't care about it so yeah it should be beautiful but it has to be more than that okay so what's my uh, thing is that I think the landscape is everything outside the building the good pieces the bad pieces the concrete pieces the things that are on slab on top of parking um, it's everything um, it really is the platform upon which everything sits so we need to really be thinking about how we start rethinking what the landscape means um, this platform inside of cities is man-made it, it isn't romantic nature it's really we construct it and that which we don't construct is decided and determined by us so it ends up being uh, you know it's an artifact so if I mean th th this is the majority of our of our urban landscape this is I mean maybe it isn't exactly like it is in other cities but pretty much you know it's just draw scape it's just leftover so the thing is, is is if we're going to build it why can't we see it as a cultural artifact and it really has to do with predisposed ideas about what a landscape should be that's the problem why we don't but we should you know we should be thinking of it as a way of uh, creating content and connection even 
when it's not possible for it to function environmentally or at a minimum. Um, I mean, in, uh, you know, parking spaces, the only thing you could do is convince them to use permeable asphalt, but you know what? People don't want to pay for it. So then you have to really, you know, I mean, those things really have to be engineered at a higher level. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean that the parking lot has to be ugly. You can imagine that it could be actually enjoyed or could create value or a conversation or controversy. It could be part of the cultural discourse. So um, given the fact, as I said, that uh, the world is now quickly urbanizing, there is so much pressure on these open spaces that if we continue to drag our old kind of ideas about what landscape is, we'll never be able to evolve a meaningful way of thinking about how to approach the design of these, of, of these spaces. Um, because they're not all going to function environmentally. Actually, most of them are negligible. Even the, the ground, you know, the green skirts around the high-rise buildings, they don't function environmentally. I mean, I, it's frustrating because everybody thinks that if you plant green, that's going to have high, you know, content in terms of its environmental impact. But it doesn't. Um, you know, you have to really go beyond the green surface to really find out how it does. And it may be that creating community and the desire for people to live in the city and make living in cities the place of choice will actually impact the way that we live globally in terms of coming into balance with our environment. That, I feel, is a major contribution if you make cities livable because that ends up helping us to use our resources in a much more economic way and Guess what? Culture comes from cities. I mean, yes, I mean, the, you know, someplace, sometimes cultures ha culture, cultural ideas happen in the suburbs, but cities collectivize wealth, which actually create these venues for culture. Universities, teaching, museums, movies, coffee houses, blah, blah, blah. Those happen in cities. So if we can figure out how to make cities places of choice, we'll be actually doing a big favor for the world environmentally as designers. So design ends up being super important. The problem is that we're not very articulate about how design actually impacts sustainability. And it turns out that if you don't create value, all the technology ain't going to help you because nobody's going to be interested in it, in, in, in valuing it. So creating value is very, very important. Okay, I'm going to show you our work, and I'm going to go through stuff really, really quickly. Um, but, yeah. For us, it's all about the landscape, and um, I take the horizontal ground plane as our topic, and where it goes is where we go. We do projects that are big, little. Um, we've done art installations, uh, big master plans, um, weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever. But um, our one kind of a, a, our goal is to work for people who want an idea, who want us to bring an idea. And if it's to do kind of naturalism, we, there are other people who will do that a lot better than we, we won't do that. We really like to recognize the true and authentic nature of the ground plane. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't work on green fields, but very, very rarely do we. We, we, we like despoiled sites, things that we really can't harm. Um, okay. I'm going to start off with a competition that we have just recently done and didn't win we, um, in Chicago. We should have won it, but we didn't. <laughs> uh, it was the uh, renovation of Navy Pier. And Navy Pier, let's see, do I have my pointer? Oh, here. Um, it's, this is about 3,000 feet. It's a super long structure. It was, a, you know, a, um, an old a shipping pier. And uh, it is on the edge of Chicago. Uh, Millennium Park is in here. And it has been redeveloped uh, as this kind of amusement park. And it has generated a tremendous amount of money for Chicago. But you know, because it's so tired and ugly and so 70s uh, that less and less people are showing up for it, um, this walkway is the major public open space. Here's this kind of neoclassical kind of drop off, which kind of is a great big landscape kind of soaker. Um, and it's at the bottom of one of uh, Chicago's Mies Towers, which is a beautiful tower. But they're trying to figure out how to regenerate this whole thing. 
And um, in order to make it actually a destination uh, for people to come to Chicago, because Chicago is actually looking for tourism from overseas. So a lot of cities are doing this now. They're trying to actually attract people to their cities to underpin their economies. So um, it turns out uh, that most of the people are from Chicago who visit this, so they really need something that's going to help put them on the map. So uh, again, I'm going to really fly through this very, very quickly. Our idea was to create a series of um, docks that can be attached to the edge of the pier so we could keep the existing um, strength of the pier, so you could actually recognize it as a pier. Um, we created a plaza. We <coughs> scooped out. We created this, um, we called the scoop, which was a dugout piece of shoreline where we created a wetland garden that would be kind of an interpretive landscape that would kind of showcase the um, natural uh, habitats and plants that would, would have grown, been growing along the edge of the Lake Michigan. Um, and there's a children's museum here, so those are attached. Um, and the idea is that people kind of walk down. There's an amusement park here, a Shakespeare theater here on an upper level. And the idea is that these docks here, they're all attached uh, at, to the bottom of the, uh, of the lake floor, but are very lightly attached uh, so that they don't do a lot of any environmental damage. But this one is for performance. This one is kind of a kid's pier that attaches to the um, a playground and amusement park. This is for fishing, boats. Uh, this is a great big uh, hot tub area that is recirculating heated water from the um, program here. And then at the end is a, um, an amphitheater where uh, it's in the wintertime it's a skating rink, in the summertime a fountain. Uh, the great thing about this opportunity is that the lake is now clean before it was really dirty. And more and more cities now have clean water where before they didn't. So that is a real uh, opportunity for them financially in order to get people to the water, you know, make it an attractive place for people to live in the city. So that is really the fundamental reason for upgrading this thing and that was the basis for our idea where there is no place in Chicago where you can get down into the water. Everything is kind of industrial age, you know, big, uh, tall walls that really protect you against the water where these docks bring you down to the water. So um, we did a very careful study of kind of what would be the most sustainable material. Turns out concrete more sustainable than anything else, more sustainable than wood, stone. Uh, you know, when you really kind of do a careful analysis, um, the embedded energy used in creating the concrete and hauling and making it, uh, this was the best uh, use of energy. So here we have um, this kind of renovated uh, amusement park, a ramp system that brings you down. Actually, the pl this would have been wood, this would have been concrete, um, this is the uh, renovated um, uh, existing amusement park, takes you down. This whole area is for kids, so the idea is that this would really be like a huge playground on the water, again, for performance, fishing, and a very kind of three-dimensionalized dock. Um, a l an art piece by Ned Kahn, who does these great pieces about kind of phenomenology and wind and sun, and then this is our kind of uh, splash pool plaza that gets you into the water, our lightning pier for fishing again, and then the, the, the city hot tub. And in the wintertime, it's winter there a lot, so really thinking about what happens in the wintertime is very important. This is a project that we did a couple years ago for Wood Wharf. Um, it's the extension of Canary Wharf, um, and um, I think Farrell's office is actually continuing this project on. But a couple years ago, it was, uh, we were working with uh, Roger Stirk Harbor. Um, this kind of shows what we do in-house. And uh, our, we're kind of like a toy shop. We've been accused of being a toy shop, which we are, because we come up with all sorts of ideas. We are good at doing lots of ideas, and we like to test ideas. And we actually bring these ideas to our clients, because we're not sure what's going to work. These are big, complicated projects. 
We like not to think too hard about them at first. We like to really come up with aesthetic strategies before we start anything, because you might solve all the, you know, issues, technologies, how people use it, blah, blah, blah. But if your client or neighborhoods don't like what they see, it ain't going to happen. So the idea that it's a linear process where you learn all about the site and that leads you to what the design is going to be is patently false. It's not true. But the clients, we had three clients, they love this idea where we, we, call it, we kind of wrapped it. We wrapped the site, which is very, very rectilinear. These towers are super tall. They're not going to be like this anymore. But you know, they were like, you know, I don't know, 70 stories high, resi, hotel, office, shopping. Um, and so the idea was to do almost an anti-canary wharf, which actually has a very solid edge, and to use the edge to get you down to the water. And we did choose wood on this, and I don't want to go into the pure procurement process, but this is really an important piece of it, where we went into an agreement with a village in South America where the clients would actually guarantee an income by having them protect the forest and selectively cutting down the wood that we needed so that their income could continue over, uh, you know, forever. So, um, but the idea was to use wood to create bridges, kind of to kind of go out into the water, to create uh, restaurants, bars, islands, and to really just kind of wiggle and noodle around the edge. So, um, you know, here they can be walkways, um, bars, uh, floating islands, and also wetlands. Um, this is a project that we're working on right now. It's in Seoul, and um, it's called Young San. We won this as a master plan working with Liebskin's office, who we you know, continue to work with quite a bit. It's huge. The site is about uh, one kilometer by one kilometer on a brownfield site. There, there it is. And um, I mean, this was the master plan about four years ago, which stacked up the buildings, but the plus about this was that we suggested a waterfront park, which Seoul just doesn't have, and using the landscape to help to clean the water and to create as much edge condition along the water. So, I mean, that was the idea uh, for this park. Um, things have moved on. Um, this is probably one of the largest projects, uh, developments being done all at once. Um, this is a tower by Renzo Piano. Um, we have um, uh, uh, two buildings by Liebskin's office. We have uh, Adrian Smith. We have uh, uh, MVRDV and BIG and uh, Coop Himmelblau and KPF and SOM and um, Asymptote and uh, I'm probably missing a few other people in there. But when everybody presented in Seoul, it was probably the biggest convocation of architects actually trying to get more work than you've ever seen, but because everybody was only able to do, do the schematic design. So um, it's kind of, uh, it's a crazy project. Uh, we uh, continue to work on each site, not for every architect, but with uh, Adrian Smith, who we've worked with before, and MVRDV, who we work with, and Big, who we work with, and Leapskin's office. Um, and what we try to do, I'm going to go through this really quickly. I mean, some are, this is a resi project. We actually try to uh, understand and um, really understand what the intent of the architecture is, you know, aesthetically, and to make sure that it's, um, that it's an integrated, holistic, environment so that there is a relationship, there's a dialogue between the architecture and the landscape, because I think that's important. I mean, I just, just to back up, m my family, everybody's an architect. Every, my father, my um, son, my husband, my uncles, my cousins, um, it, it's a family disease. Um, I was <laughs> smart enough and I had seen enough. I grew up on the floor of my dad's office. No, I never wanted to be an architect. I went to art school. But I love architecture. Architecture is awesome. So um, that's also probably why we have problems, is that um, we're always trying to do something that 
is in step with the architecture as opposed to like, okay, the architecture is a soft, is a hard thing and we're just this inchoate nothing at the bottom. We actually try to make that extend out. So there are some architects who really enjoy working that way. I'm not going to go in exactly what all these are. This is Liebskin's off, um, office's um, office tower. The other one was residential. There are two very different buildings. This one kind of is twisting. So the idea of these, of these facades twisting out and creating all, you know, entrances and places to eat and entrances into garages, these, all of these are landscapes on structure. This one is an awesome building. This is MVRDV. This freaked everyone out because people thought they were kind of almost replicating 9-11. I mean, the client said that this itself was worth every penny they paid MVRDV in terms of the controversy around it, but uh, Vinny was like, oh, I don't know, I said, just stay with it because it's an awesome idea. So, the, uh, you know, there's this kind of cloud in the sky and MVRDV and BIG uh, work together on one site which we actually, this is BIG's project which is also a beauty. Um, we came up with this idea of uh, this Jacobo which is a, a Korean uh, quilt idea that would really deal with the nature of the buildings and would be kind of loose enough to be able to tie the two together because they, they actually do have a relationship, thank God. Um, and of course, you, we do use plants. We, we are very, very interested, careful, and we have to work carefully with um, local horticulturalists who really know their stuff. They know about microclimates, they know about availability, they know about what's specific to that area in terms of sustainability, but we kind of use seasonal co colors, um, scale, um, evergreens, fruiting trees, I mean, uh, ground covers, we really are very, very uh, careful and intentional in terms of choices of planting, but we also make sure that we're careful to design places for different aged people, it's important. Uh, this is a project we did in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, this is also in our book. This is a kind of the zero, zero corner for a, you can see, a not very dense city. All these are one-story buildings. The majority of the ground plane is parking. The, so most of it is the landscape. This is what the landscape looks like. It's just asphalt. But they decided that they were going to build a performing arts center with, um, God, it's not a timer. I hate this. Hold on. Um, the idea was to create th th three theaters here, an art gallery and a school, and we wanted to create, we wanted to keep the street edge here because there is no street edge. <laughs> There's very little, but um, the idea was to create um, a reason to come into Mesa and to attract people to move there. So th what we did is we kind of created an interior street and then um, inhabited with smaller stages. So there are small scale stages that basically creates a three ring circus. So all sorts of performances can take place and there's kind of a, a, a seating area, this seating area, so there are kind of very um, kind of spontaneous seating areas. The stage areas are kind of backed by these um, translucent glass panels. But each one of these actually shows or kind of um, actually allows the native uh, plants, the cactus, to be on stage. So everything is on stage here. The plants are on stage, people are on stage. We have these, uh, these water uh, channels uh, that we ripped off from the Villa Lante, which are water tables that have only about an inch of water in them so people can splash around in between um, uh, performances. And you can use water even in an arid uh, area like this. I mean, water is really precious. So this area, this is kind of, we call it, it's the ditch. And this ditch fills up, there's a great big basin, it fills up with water, and then it spills out, fills up the ditch, and then it, then it goes dry. And in that way, we can save all the water from evaporation, and it's on a computerized timer. But it goes off, and people wait around for it to kind of go off, and then it drains, and it comes back. So it becomes kind of an event as well. And then creating um, trellises and structures that create interesting shadows is important. This is on top of the art gallery. And at nighttime, the uh, clear stories that actually go down and bring light below 
uh, glow at night. So uh, I'm very proud about this because it's the number one place in Arizona to have your wedding pictures taken. So that's, that's a great thing. Uh, you may be aware of uh, Exchange Square in Manchester. Um, this is the Corn Exchange Building, Arnsdale Center. This area was uh, blasted like in 1995 by the IRA. Um, again, this is the urban landscape. This is, you know, this is typical of what we'll be presented with, like, you know, in terms of what a landscape is. So um, we, were, we won this in a competition. Our competition entry was really about, um, sorry about this, um, knitting the old section with the city to the new section. And there is a geological a rift here where there's a, a big outcropping of Yorkstone where the cathedral district is on. The upper district is the shopping. So we kind of knitted these two levels together along these ramps. And the ramps provide these seating areas for people just to hang out. And then we kind of resurrected an old stream here. And then the upper plaza is kind of an ode to the train industry without which the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have happened. But the, you know, the intent of these benches was to create opportunities for people just to hang out and do whatever they want. Um, Claire Cooper Marcus thinks you have to sit across from each other to have a dialogue. I disagree. I think people want to invent their own ways of using space. So this is the hanging ditch, and it's probably the most popular place to hang out and do stupid stuff on. Um, but it's a, you know, people, um, well, I said, well, why don't you use people in your projects? You know, why don't you show people using your, pro your projects? Um, so here are people using the project, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, this is uh, in uh, Dublin. This, this is also uh, uh, a, uh, it's a, it's a redevelopment area. It's the Docklands. And this, uh, this plaza is on top of a garage. And we were asked to do this first before they were going to build a performing arts center, hotels, and uh, retail here. This is office. And the client said, look, um, this, you need to make it colorful because the city is gray, and we have to tell the world we're open for business. So um, it turns out that uh, this is the theater that Leapskin designed, and our strategy, well, again, we can't plant trees on slabs that don't have enough steel in it. And in order to put enough steel and a root ball, you have to dig deeper and spend more money. That's why very rarely do we get the opportunity to plant things on surfaces that are on top of structure. So it's the case here. We couldn't put anything of weight because there was this kind of broken down old uh, parking lot underneath it. So we created a forest of red poles and threw out the red carpet. And then the green has enough um, capacity to hold soil. So we planted uh, native species of grasses and sedges. So this was actually built before the uh, theater went in, but uh, th this now has really become a big party place. Um, the, uh, it's put them on the map. Uh, they kind of use it to advertise Dublin. The good news about this project is that even though they are in their cups in terms of their economy, everything around the space is doing just fi fine financially. The hotels are full, the restaurants are full, um, the offices are full. So it turns out that if you actually design a, you know, um, interesting places for people to be, um, it helps the economy. It helps to keep their, the longevity of, it, of the surrounding uses. So these are very, very instrumental in creating economic stability. So I mean, this is what we can do as designers, is that we can actually uh, enable cities to operate. Um, this is a Swiss Re headquarters building in Munich. Um, this is kind of a funny group where they went out to, to Unterführing, which is in the suburbs, and they weren't sure who their neighbors were going to be. So they built a hedge that is like one, two, three stories up above the ground, this flying hedge, because the office buildings are on top of the kind of the, so the public uses of the building. So this is um, this kind of crazy building. It was designed by Pota, uh, Boda Tarani Richter in Hamburg. And it was so Byzantine that w 
the, the, how the landscape really functioned was to be able to tell where you were. So we divided the building up, which basically had kind of a square donut, into four quadrant, color-coded quadrants. Now everything, every landscape in this project is a roof garden. So this stop starts on top, the top roof garden where the offices are, and looking down into a water courtyard. And below are, you know, where the library and the uh, cafeteria and meeting rooms are. But this is also, these are roof gardens on top of parking. So we were asked on board because they finally figured out that plants wouldn't grow where there couldn't be any sun. So uh, you guys have a big job in front of you to, before everybody gets out of school in architecture here, make sure to remind them that plants need sun. It'll help. So um, what we had to do is we had to kind of make up things that would actually work in the shade like, you know, stainless steel boxes and colored glass and red dyed logs, fields of um, mirrored gazing globes to scare away the witches. It's an insurance company. This is the yellow quadrant. And then, uh, you know, this kind of, these are the office buildings looking down into these courtyards. Where we can grow, where there is sun, we planted. Where there isn't sun, we didn't. Um, it doesn't mean that we hate plants. We like plants. In the middle, um, the architects wanted a, a water courtyard, but again, we didn't want to use a lot of water, but all these elements come in the middle. And when you're looking down, you can see them, but when you come in at f ground level, it's just a pure reflection of, of the, of the uh, light and the buildings around it. Abu Dhabi, oh, this is, this is still under construction. Uh, Nigel Koch, who's in the, off, in the audience here, goes out there and tries to kind of make it happen for us. But um, uh, this is, has been a really tough project. Again, our role is on top of shopping. Uh, these, are, these buildings are done by De Stefano Getch Architects out of Chicago, and in this case, Instead of making a seamless transition between the kind of masculine nature of the buildings, we decided that your grandmother's antimacassar, a more feminine kind of armchair kind of landscape, would be a good thing here. And again, um, this wasn't engineered to hold much weight, so we had to go in between structure and find pockets where we could do planting. But the whole thing is basically made out of green wall technology that has been folded like origami to create mounds and break down the space. So um, we're not quite done with this yet, but things are growing. Um, we uh, used different plant material according to how much sun they were going to get. The planter edges are done out of stone. Um, that, and. Uh, this is the first time I've actually seen these. These have been milled, and there'll be small uh, riffles of water that flow on the benches in the back. So you have the sound of water, the feel of water. It's not a lot of water, but um, it will be kind of a refreshing green environment in an environment that is almost impossible to make green. So uh, through this technological approach, we've actually created the sense of being in this green landscape. Um, this is a project we don't show a lot. It's a housing project in Vienna uh, that spans a highway, and it is uh, a huge housing, uh, low-cost housing project. Here is a landscape. It's a very, very skinny space that goes from this road all the way down to the, a lower road, about uh, 15 meters down, so it's on a slope. And the idea here is that, I mean, there are so many people from different cultures that they come, immigrants, and it's, these open spaces have to perform as spaces where kids can integrate, because in the open spaces is where integration, social integration actually happens. So the spaces have been uh, used to actually connect, to break it down into playgrounds, uh, places where people can meet, hang out. Uh, people tend to like to stick in their own groups but they also like to check out what the other groups are doing. And in this way, they can kind of more naturally start to feel at home. But the good story about this, and, and it's a series of almost kind of these shallow mountains where p the kids can play, but also help to divide up the space. This is a, a school that's been built. Um, it's a sliding board, playground, you know. So, you know, th th there are kind of rough areas that have been devoted to different kind of activities. But 
The really wonderful story about this one is that it is the place of choice. The people, the, the people who move into Vienna are looking for housing. They can actually choose, uh, like a lottery, where they get to live. And this one is the number one choice. And it's because the, the, this landscape, the open space, has helped to enable a sense of community. So there's a community group who are really vested in keeping it up and having events. Um, and so it has really functioned to create a much more cohesive community, which is really great. Um, so, you know, there are, are three or four of these different amphitheaters, uh, different things that kids can play on. Uh, if you don't create landscapes for kids, especially in, in uh, immigrant cultures, you know, that have a lot of youth, uh, it's, it, it's a problem. We, you have to think about how to really keep children, and especially, you know, teenagers, busy. These aren't teenagers, but... <laughs> Okay, we're getting close. Um, this is an art installation we were asked to do a few years ago in Reykjavik for the Museum of Contemporary Art. This is our installation. It is kind of settles in between this kind of beautiful little um, art museum. It is very much like a geode where it's very rough and blank and black on the outside and crystalline in the inside. And the topic of this was aluminum because of their geothermal uh, energy, they can smelt aluminum, and they're really screwing up their environment, they're screwing up their culture. It is a real problem because they have an unforgiving landscape. It's a, like, a, like the moon. So when they screw up their landscape, it's just screwed up. It doesn't grow over. So deserts and rock-like landscapes are very fragile. So this was kind of like, you know, the old adage, all that glitters is not gold. Uh, we built this. This is Dan Gass from BAM, who are out in Beijing now. And we actually, with a, the with a design crew, kind of went in there and built this sucker. But nobody can go inside of it. You can only see it from these windows on the outside of this kind of crystalline hole. But this is kind of what you see when you're l looking out. You can only see pieces of this interior. You're never sure where it is. You're not sure what the scale is. You can't see the whole thing. So the windows actually are very deep. There are these portals, we call it. And it really allows you only to see pieces of it. But th the way it's been designed is that you go into this black hallway. Your eyes dilate. And you can't help it. You have to look into the center. And then you're, it, it's painful because this light is just burning your retinas. So the light just pours out and you stand there and your eyes get fried. So it's kind of about this, you know, you got to be careful of beauty itself or of money. I mean, it's like, you know, be careful what you wish for. So this is kind of what it looks like when you're inside of it. But what was very rewarding about this one is that people came away from it um, saying, well, this kind of reminds me a lot of Reykjavik. We really always try to do something that is inherently about the site we're on. We try. Whether it's a narrative about the architecture, history, geology, phenomenology, we try to put a picture together that somehow is site-specific. Everyone, every project is different. I thought this might be fun. It's, we're here at the AA. This is a wacky project we were asked um, to do in Dubai during the Gogo years. We worked on this with uh, Woods Baggett. This was the really tall tower that never happened. This thing was over a kilometer high. This is the one that had four buildings that were strapped together. I mean, this was taller than the Burj. Um, so we were brought on board to kind of fantasize what a landscape for the world's tallest tower might be. And uh, the, uh, this is the tower here. It kind of has this uh, lower building around it, which we, um, uh, that finally kind of went away so that we could actually make a, a better connection. But I just want to show you some, like when we're actually let loose to think and to dream, uh, this was a great project for that. So we started off with a bang. We said, okay, the, this is a really tall tower. It's over a kilometer high, but Landscapes are actually higher, like that's Mount Everest. So landscapes can be really tall. Um, then we thought about, okay, well, what 
kinds of things could we imagine is happening in the future? So we thought, well, what about robots? What if we had a robotic landscape? And what would that look like? Or what could that do that it's not doing now? Um, so we studied all sorts of robots and um, kind of things that about parking. We actually thought about tents because it's so hot out there. You can't really go outside unless you're in shade. So we actually worked with um, MIT to come up with fabrics that were both a combination of living material and inert material. But uh, you know, the, the way that goat's hair works is to kind of uh, expand when it's hot and shrink when it's, it's, it's less hot so that it provides more shade. And so we work with these fab fabrics, this idea of, of a real living fabric, and a tent at the bottom of the building. But this tent, actually you'll see, is movable because it's on robotic arms that travel around the site and telescope out when it's needed and densify when it's needed and goes away when it's not needed. So why not? I think it's a good idea. So here is this tent that kind of creates holes and openings and moves around. Uh, we looked at really, really big machines. The theme of this was just really, really big. So these machines, I mean, there are these really, really big machines for mining and agriculture and uh, we thought, well, what if we created a machine for environmental um, health and creating food. So we have these kind of huge big wheels that are slowly turning and using, uh, uh, creating air filters and um, agriculture. So here we actually have these turning green wheels where cattle and farm animals could graze as they slowly turned and regenerated themselves and so forth and so on. It was kind of a whole living system. Okay, the next idea was, okay, um, this is like building on the moon, so what would we have to do to actually create an environment living on the moon? So this idea was about kind of alien natures. And um, we started pulling all this together, and uh, we thought, well, if we were to build the world's tallest garden, how would we do it? And one idea is that we would plant redwood trees, or transplant redwood trees, because they're the tallest plants in the world. So. I mean, I know that environmentally maybe that's not the wisest thing in the, in, to do. However, uh, we thought we would see whether it's possible. And it is possible to transplant redwoods. Nikhil also happened to own one of the world's three big blimps, which are these huge things that carry big machinery up to the Arctic. So we could actually have transported these things. And then we put them in our, you know, in kind of these capsules where we could uh, do, you know, change the climate and make sure that we could grow them, like in a big bell jar. So you know, the idea is that we would have these bell jars with uh, redwood trees in them. And then we started co combining these ideas that, you know, created internal vertical circulation and the tent and these um, kind of uh, climate controlled capsules. So uh, this was kind of a, a, uh, a combination of a variety of these different ideas, but it was actually uh, the idea of, of this, this kind of roving tent, uh, these internalized uh, environments that was actually coupled with the school of, uh, of botany and environment. That, I mean, it, it, it could have been done. Of course, then the environment collapsed and, and uh, the economy did too. But there were good ideas, and it was really a great opportunity to, to dream. So this is the last project. This is, again, an installation in Xi'an, China. Um, the topic of this was, hold on, the, um, we were told that we needed to do an installation that was about the harmonious coexistence between city and nature. So of course we thought, oh, that's ridiculous. We're not going to do that. But that is exactly what we did. So the title of this is The Harmonious Coexistence Between City and Nature. But what we did do was we decided that we were going to build it out of local material in, uh, in materials that cr the craftsmen knew how to do. And you know, this is where the low fields in China are, where you know, it's kind of a very soft rock, a compacted earth, where people um, kind of created th these, uh, these almost, not, they're not cave houses, they're houses that are really carved out of the low. So these are kind of original ideas about our garden where we'd have this green on top and kind of these spaces kind of dug down. Um, kind of what does that mean translated to a square? Our, each one of our sites, I think you saw Elko's recently, I mean there are about 
30 meters by 30 meters. Ours was really based on a traditional maize garden crossed with a fun house. And, and the idea is that the whole thing is made out of brick. It's a maze. You walk in, and there are uh, these kind of almost endless uh, archways that lead you into hallways. None of the hallways are parallel. And uh, you basically try to get yourself to this spot here, and then you go out. So, I mean, this is an elevation that we did. Again, you know, I get uh, landscape, walls. We do walls. And so, but the end of each hall has a mirror so that you kind of get the sense that things are continuing. You're not sure where you are in space. And it has this sense that it just, it, it kind of goes on. That was the intent. So this is kind of looking at it from the outside. And I would say that it was so successful in terms of kind of showing an urban nature that when we got there, all the garbage cans for this area were lined up against the wall. So I thought, okay, um, it must read urban to them. And then we planted willows, but the willows were planted in such a way that you never saw their trunks. So this is going into the hallway, and immediately you have a mirrored surface. Um, and when we were there, I, I, I have to say, we didn't know this was going to happen, but uh, it turns out the most interesting thing to people are other people, but even more so themselves. So people, I mean, people were just always looking at themselves. It was hilarious. And um, then you turn in and you have these hallways that go on and on. So um, people started wandering through. You just, uh, people would start playing games. Um, you know, it was, uh, people were also a bit put off because they couldn't make decisions. They didn't know which door to go into, so it was kind of also high anxiety. And um, sometimes you could make a wrong turn or go into a place that was too tight. Uh, often you would end up in a dead end, and the dead end was a mirrored room, and you had to go back out and try to go into another door. So it was like kind of, I, I've always dreamed of going to the city, you know, the, um, I forget what it's called, the, the, the city in Kowloon, what was it called? Uh, Marcus, what's the name of, you know, that was torn down? City. Yeah, the walled city. Yeah, the walled city. I've always wanted to be there. So this is kind of my interpretation or dream of a walled city. Uh, gardens often have these bells. So the bells, we had a thousand bells. Um, and then we're just, just watching people watch themselves. Finally, you get to the end, and there is a room that is, an, uh, is meant to be an endlessly reflected forest. So you go from city into forest. And then there are these weird reflections that I can say that we didn't really anticipate. Finally, when you come out, you go down the hallways, there are two of them, and it's only then until you realize that all these mirrors are one-way mirrors. And we were like, oh my God, Pe you know, it's like people really don't know they're being watched. Like this woman was adjusting her underpants and uh, it was kind of nasty. It was really nasty and um, uh, people were just <laughs> laughing and some people were pissed off that they had been watched and they ended up watching. So it was really, <laughs> the subtext of this was kind of big brother. Um, this couple, I mean, this guy's so sincere and, <laughs> s yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, in the end, it, it, we, we got very good feedback, like, like, this is so Chinese, and that's what it was meant to be. So, I mean, I, for us, the way people use spaces, uh, that they enjoy it, they have fun, uh, is really important. In the end, it really comes down to people and what people value. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know what time it is. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I know it's late. I don't know. People, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Ah, there is a mic there. Yeah, we're just going to open for yeah. questions if you're okay. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so anybody? Any questions? Any questions? All is clear. Can I ask you a question? I'll get to, I mean, how many people are in the landscape urbanism program? How many people are in architecture? What's everybody else doing here? 
<laughs> How are you guys? All right. Uh, urban design, uh, fashion design, shoe design, design. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you you had a question. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, They seem to have gotten a little bit bigger in scale. And uh, I guess I was wondering, you know, with that scale, does your creativity get bigger or is it pretty equal in both? Um, we have gotten a lot bigger because it turns out, I mean, we can scale up. As it tur we didn't, I didn't know that about myself but, and, and the practice. But uh, we're really good at s strategic thinking. Um, so we're asked to come on board. but. Um, the bigger projects, it's hard to turn them down. Um, and I, I think that we've been pretty good at being able to hold the course in terms of still producing you know, interesting designs. Um, they're often more fraught, more complicated. Uh, yeah, I mean, bigger things are just more complicated and more difficult to actually kind of keep your edge because there's so many issues. But uh, I feel really good about what we've produced at, at a bigger scale. Um, however, I still really enjoy the luxury of doing very small things and exactly what we are trying to do, we do, because it's a way of testing our ideas. But there's no two ways about it. I think you'll find a lot of people feel that there, you have to give a lot in order to go up in scale. But the scale issues are also interesting because it makes you think and work with other people in a way that you haven't. I've learned a ton of stuff working with really great collaborators. Um, it's a learning curve. But you know, if you spend your time just doing big projects, um, you, you, you know you may end up just getting bigger and bigger projects. So it's always about walking that line between keeping your edge and kind of and actually doing a lot of good for a lot of people with bigger projects too. So that doesn't mean that making art doesn't do a lot of good for a lot of people. But you know, we, we try to keep a balance. Other questions? As, uh, in your ex uh, experience, uh, what cases do you think that the landscape architect can dominate the project instead of the architect? And what's the situation uh, now and the future, do you think? Well, uh, I don't know whether dominate is the right word for it. Um, because, well, seriously, because we, there's so much information to be learned now that you know, we kind of have to focus on what we're doing. So I find that the most interesting teams are the people who come together who kind of have a particular area of deep knowledge. It's like working with specialists. But I think the change may be in terms of maybe who comes first. Uh, and in many situations, uh, like we, we work with environmental engineers, so what should happen before there are building decisions made? Like how much can a site actually hold? What is the carrying capacity? What are the areas that have to be preserved so that can actually operate environmentally? Uh, I mean, these are all really, you know, what are the uses? How should it be used? And how do you start to build that up into a building program and an economic program? And then how do you then get that modeled up so that the buildings and the approach to the landscape start to mesh? So, you know, it's really about, and everybody should be working together from the beginning. So it isn't really even about dominating, it's about I think we will, and we have been asked to come to the table earlier on in the pro process, which is good because it really means that there are more possibilities that are put forward because you have more thought about, you know, citing things. But, you know, our understanding about the landscape and the functioning of the landscape is becoming more and more important, so it's important to have that input early, early on. And it's not about design, it's about strategy. So I think it's going to happen more and more.
other questions? Yes. architecture like you said than just putting the landscape at the bottom of the buildings and I guess having worked with many experienced architects I'm wondering still at that level what are some misconceptions you still experience? No. no None? No. Just kidding. Um, let me um, let me put it this way. Um, there are architects who feel that their voice should be the only voice and that everybody supports that. Um, actually, it's really good to have a, I mean, that's not a bad thing. But, um, you know, the, the model of the landscape being this very kind of blank place so that the building is actually displayed, this is kind of an old school approach. Some people stick with that. And other architects are super happy to have ideas put on the table so that they can actually consider them. So we tend to work with the architects who like that. And the architects that don't like that don't choose to work with us, unfortunately, actually. So it, it really is about how flexible you are and you know whether other ideas, there are room for other ideas, or whether, yeah, whether you like to play with others. I don't know. So, um, but we, we've been very, very lucky and have worked with just super excellent architects who are, you know, really fun to work with. And w that, that's very, that's really pleasurable because that, that's how the, I think the best projects get done. I, you know, I, I think that it, uh, a client is always served better with more ideas and the more integrated the team is, I think. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, this yeah. is something I've, uh, I think it also came in the as in the questions to to Elko a couple of weeks ago. What is what is your view on on the role of the discourse of sustainability and within landscape architecture? I mean, what is the influence of the whole sustainable? Uh, influence in, in landscape architecture? Mm -hmm. Is it good, bad, or how should landscape architects react to the way things have been developing with regards to this sort of uh, overarching uh, question? I, that's a good question. Um, I think that the issue of sustainability as awkward and hackneyed and imprecise that word is, has been very good for landscape architecture because we are the green part of the green discussion. And until recently, when you Google up or research sustainability, all you get is building technologies. The voice of landscape has been very mute. You go to these conferences, nobody talks about the landscape. I, I mean, it's shocking. It shocked me. So I think it. Um, if nothing else, uh, well, two things. I mean, this is a lot. First of all, people are aware that we have to get our act together in terms of renewable resources and how we plan cities. And I mean, nature really doesn't care about us, but if we want to survive, we have to care about it. Um, so that has popped up in the screen, even in the United States. Oh my God, it turns out it's not just an imagination, you know, a figment of the Democratic Party. It's real. But the other thing is that uh, what I think is interesting is that there is very little advocacy for how what we do, which is design, fits into sustainability. That I think is interesting. And my thinking about that is that if we aren't more articulate about what our particular gifts are, what we can do and how we can create better places, more collectivized places to live in. We're going to lose it. We have to make sure that we are articulate about what we do, which is to design, to give physical form, to create a relationship between people. Value, human value. Uh, 
I think that we have to be better about that because we can't just get lost in technology because landscape is not technologically based. It isn't. Not compared to architecture. And all the companies that really promote technologies in architecture are making so much money, but there is not that audience in landscape. Our, we have issues that are both you know, absolutely fundamental to the sustainability issue, but it's harder to make money from it. So, you know, it, yeah, it, it makes it a more difficult topic to explain to people. And I also believe that on a site-by-site -site basis, we don't have much to add. Okay, you put the building here, you can collect more sunshine, you plant more trees, you can cut down, blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows how the landscape can work technologically. But the real value is in planning. That's why the big scale projects are really important because it's only through the larger scale or urban scale that the landscape becomes super important in terms of connectivity on every level. So that's when we can do the most good for the environment. And then space by space, that's how we can do the most good for culture and people. Transportation, that has to be done on a bigger level. You know, collecting water, street trees. Uh, we, we need to think about not plucking trees in, in between the infrastructure. These systems have to be fully operational on a large scale. So I think the sustainability discussion has energized the profession and has created a real, you know, it's like at the scale of modernism was in the early 1900s. That's how important this whole issue of climate change and natural resources and urbanization and seven billion people in the world. We really have a very strong raison d'etre now. So I, th I think it's energizing, I think it's been great. That's my own feeling. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. One more, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Martha, I, I, I appreciate your aesthetic about landscape. And um, I see landscape as joy, as candy. And, and I'm learning landscape urbanism, so I see landscape urbanism as a container of candies. I don't, I don't know if you agree with this. Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I do really want to know um, your vision of this container from maybe an aesthetic way or a functional way. Well, um, uh, I, well, the container for me translates into kind of strategies and how we implement these larger systems and thinking about, you know, how to connect everything, how to connect landscapes that function environmentally, people to place. Um, or how to, I mean, there are so many cities being built now. There are so many different situations. We're really just learning how to approach all these different cities. They're all different. There's no one way. Even the, whether you can plan anything, you, you can't really even plan anything, so you have a strategy. But having an idea about what needs to be done is still better than no idea at all, even if you know you can't implement it. So I think, in one sense, advocacy for this, making sure that this way of thinking is really brought to the table to decision makers and city planners and politicians, super important. Doing what you can do to set a good example, teaching other practitioners and trying to bring, you know, advocate for it. We need a generation of advocacy now. It's really up to you guys, because we fucked up. But you guys now have to really figure out how to go forward with it. So that's your container. But every piece that you do is precious, because it can, I mean, if you can write a book, if you can change the world, you can change the world on a table. You don't need a big site, as long as you have a concept and you have a, something that is really somehow translates to other people, brings meaning or enlightenment. So it isn't about size either. Because if you don't know how to design and build, then, then what are we doing? You can't just strategize. You have to build things too. That may be a, a bit, um, let me put it this way, at the GSD that might be a little controversial. But yeah, you have to build things. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.